I'm Claudine Wong, joining you from the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm joined now by Rebecca Rienzi, who is the Executive Director of Pathfinders from, for Autism in Baltimore, Maryland. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Okay, so we wanted to talk about, um, you know, just what you guys do, how much has, how far we've come, you know, as we are looking at Autism Awareness Month and people really just understanding autism because it is all a learning process, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, well, we, okay. What do you think that we've learned over the years? I mean, I'll just get right down to it because I know that there are lots of stats that kind of explain to the people who haven't been touched by someone with autism, who don't have a familiarity, um, what we've learned most about it. I mean, what do you think the, the, the big lesson is for people? Um, I think um, for us, certainly, um, the really big lesson is everybody focus on science and they focus on treatment and that's really important but I think the biggest lesson that we've learned is really understanding that each each person with autism is an individual and the most important thing is that when you're interacting with someone with autism you presume intellect. Um, people with autism may not be verbal, they may communicate differently, they may not appear to understand what you're saying but that is very much not the case and we want folks to um, really presume that that person can understand and may just communicate differently with you than than you expect or you're used to. Yeah, let's talk about Pathfinders because you help families um, who get this diagnosis figure out where to go next. And I think what is interesting is people don't realize how many families are really affected. And I'll throw up this graphic. So, I mean, 20 years later of, of working in this field and helping families, do you think it surprises people how impactful autism is in this country? Um, I think it still does. I think um, despite the fact that it is so prevalent, you know, one in 54 children in the United States are diagnosed, but still, if, if you, um, if you're not living it, if you're not experiencing it in your family or a neighbor or in your classroom, uh, you often see sort of that staggering reaction when you tell folks. I'm out in the community often talking about autism and its prevalence, and, and people are still surprised. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's, you know, uh, you know autism is a very um, diverse um, diagnosis. People present very differently, and so folks may be interacting with, folk, with other individuals with autism and not realize that they're interacting with people with autism, and there's still a lot that people just don't understand if they're, again, not interacting day to day. Um, with people with the diagnoses. Right. I mean, if, unless you, when you experience it personally, as much as you, you may read about it or, or think you know about it, you, you get a whole nother lesson when it, it is in your personal everyday, everyday life. Let's, let, yeah, let's talk about Pathfinders though. I mean, mm-hmm. in terms of the story behind your organization, tell me how it started. Sure, so it started 20 years ago by a group of parents who were looking for a better way to get information. And again, 20 years ago, there was no internet, there wasn't the type of fast paced information exchange that we're used to now. So it's hard to, hard to remember back thinking, I, I can just Google that. Well, you couldn't do that. And so finding good, reliable information was really important to the parents that founded the organization. They were finding out they were learning more from each other than they were from the professionals in the field. And so they wanted to create a place that anyone could reach out and get guidance. Uh, What are the latest treatments? What opportunities and resources are in their community? How can they connect with other families to learn more? And that was the whole goal behind it, make getting information easier. And we're seeing pictures of E.J. Serhoff, who is an Orioles. He was also associated with other teams. We'll just stick with Baltimore. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was here the longest. <laughs> it, it was his second child, Mason, who was diagnosed with autism. And, and that really led him on this journey. And he says he knew next to zero about autism when mm-hmm. his son got the diagnosis. Yes, that's correct. Mason was diagnosed when they were still in Milwaukee, but when the family moved back to Baltimore and his wife Polly is a Baltimore native, they moved back here, he joined the team and Polly, you know, was just um, relentless on finding resources and information for her son. And she really was the one that recognized that not everybody was getting the same information and resources that she did and was able to find. And so she's sort of started the whole idea of bringing parents together um, to share a treatment option that she, at the time they were 
they were exploring for Mason. And that was really the catalyst of bringing all these other parents together of, of there were parents of students that were in the same class as Mason to learn about what each other is doing. And so that was sort of like the, the light bulb went off. Yeah. This group of parents in the room were like, we need to have a better way to share this information. And you know, Polly and BJ will say, if, if we weren't getting access to this information and we did have resources that not everyone else had, you know, there are going to be parents that, that really have um, are, are not getting this, and we need to make sure everybody has the same access to this information that we do. From and so that, that moment, yeah, how did it grow over the next two decades? Um, so, you know, the first few years, it grew slowly, as, as most organizations mm -hmm. do, while the core uh, board of directors uh, raised money and sort of figured out what our programs were going to be. And so about three years into the journey, they hired their first staff person, which was a resource center coordinator, and that's the person that answered the hotline for that parent that just got the diagnosis and said, what do I do next? And again, that's early on in technology. So a lot of our resources were given over the phone or mailed in big fat packages. <laughs> that um, way, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, articles and such were all sent through the mail. Um, but obviously as, as time evolved and the need kept growing, obviously there was a tremendous need um, in our community for this information. Um, you know, the, we were able to raise the funds and a, a second staff person was hired in um, 2005. That was our, our first executive director. And then from there, we just sort of sort of took off. You know, we've, we've been expanding ever since for the last 15 years. You know, we've tripled our size. Um, you know, we serve over 16,000 people across the state of Maryland. Um, and we have you know, now have nine employees. So we, we've grown quite a lot in the That's 20 awesome. years. Yes. Yeah. And how has this epidemic, this pandemic that we're dealing with really impacted the people that you are trying to help because certainly, you know, it makes, it's making everything harder for, for people, but people with autism, if, if they are dependent on services or even routine and schedule, Absolutely. it can be very impactful. We're definitely hearing from the families that we serve. You know, we have we still have our helpline and it is operational. And that change of routine is huge. Uh, many individuals with autism very much like to have that structure. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, not going to school or not going to their day program or not going to the, whatever services they might get that week is really does throw um, them for a loop. I mean, all of us who've had to go home and, and rethink how we live, we know how stressful this has been. And, individuals with autism it is a tenfold situation they very much many often are very much um need that routine and then of course there's the anxiety um issues that often comes along with an autism diagnosis so we're definitely seeing um increased calls about how to address anxiety and ocd tendencies especially when um, families cannot access those those resources some of some of the children and adults we serve are seeing um, providers two and three times a week, which they're no longer getting those um, those services and doing telehealth can be very challenging for some individuals right. in order to get- It's not the same, right? <laughs> it's not the same. And then if you're also looking at communication barriers, that may or may not be the best way to, to do the services. So we're definitely seeing a lot of stress um, from our families. Um, we're, we are trying to provide as much information as we can about how to access services differently, as well as ways to sort of cope with, you know, being at home, bringing some fun opportunities and some new opportunities for learning um, virtually into the home to You're try right. to drive. I mean, you also talk about your growth and hiring employees and, and expanding, mm -hmm. and now we're in this economic crisis as well as a pandemic, which, you know, I've talked to a lot of nonprofits, it, it makes the need to be there for people even greater, but the fear that you're not going to be able yeah. to be there for people also greater. It doesn't, those don't, don't necessarily work together very well. Exactly, exactly. We definitely, um, it's interesting because I've, I've been commenting to my colleagues about how a lot of folks share on social media that, oh, I'm home, I'm relaxing, it's nice having this time off. And I think for many people, particularly in nonprofit setting, this has not been a relaxing time. We are working 10, 15 hours a day from home, um, trying to help the families that we serve or get them the services or get them the information. So it's definitely, um, I think, a more stressful and much more hours put in. And you're right, the resources to, to fund that have, in some cases, completely just stopped overnight. So that um, the funding um, is a challenge and concern. And 
uh, pathfinders like many organizations are trying to figure out how to um, keep the cash flow coming in so that we can keep our programs going. Yeah, keep the lights you know, on, the heat on. Exactly. The programs going, right? I mean, it's, exactly, exactly. It's we very, wanna be here during this crisis and we need to be here after this crisis um, ends, whenever that might be, if it's two months, six months, whenever it is, we need to be back and functioning and, and ready to help in so whatever. What you're doing. Yeah, I mean, what are you guys trying to do to get to that, that goal? I mean, the helpline is, is how you are helping folks, but also the community is what I think is probably a big, big part of this, still having that connection to say, I'm not alone in this and I'm not struggling by myself. Absolutely. So uh, yes, the helpline is going and people can reach us to us via the phone, the internet, our Facebook page, email, they can access us and we will work one-on-one -on -one with them to get them information. But sort of globally, we have our, um, we have a whole COVID resources page on our website so folks can access us at any time and get information about what the local public schools are doing as far as distance learning, where they can get lunches still, um, what are articles on different ways to cope, other resources and telehealth services that, are, that have come out. So anything that they might be looking for, they can find there. And of course, we're sharing all of those resources on our social media as well. We then also wanted to pivot and bring in um, pull the a big part of, just so we can see that. Oh, great, great. <laughs> a then, big part of what we do is also training and, and then recreational fun opportunities for the family. So we have pivoted all our training to be available online. And we've started uh, just last week, launched our first Zoom training. And that went well. That was on the um, IEP, the individual lives education um, that individuals with um, disabilities often get and sort of the changes of how that, you know, how do you get your services when you're not in school. So that was a really well received training and we're going to be doing more hopefully about every two weeks bringing a new training into the home. And then we're also really big on bringing the social opportunities. We do that year round as an organization at venues in, in around the state of Maryland, but now we're gonna do it in your home. So we have dance parties and scavenger hunts and, and trivia games, and we're exploring all kinds of other opportunities to get folks, give them a social opportunity, yeah. um, to see each other, just have fun. Um, some I'm of those up do, your uh, social distancing. Yeah, that party. was a lot of fun, <laughs> and that was uh, free to participate. We did have a fundraising component that was along with it for folks that wanted to give, and we were able to raise some money, which was really wonderful. And it was so well received, so we're gonna have another one on May 1st. Um, and then we've done some other things like the trivia game and we're going to do our first scavenger hunt this week and see how that goes and and we just keep trying to find ways to, to have the families to enjoy their time at home and no, I think um, that's connect that's with great. other families and I see I see they have t-shirts too. So that's yes. part of it. The fundraising component of it too, I think is is a is a big part of it, right? When you, you, yes. know, you have people able to you know just you know raise money while having having a good time and, and yes a little bit showing off your best moves, <laughs> which is always <laughs> it's always great and, and i mean have you seen that that kind of i mean is that is is the fundraising component helping you through it i mean is it working because other, other nonprofits, i think are trying to figure out is that going to work it's a good idea but yeah but is it going to work it, it is, so far it is working. Um, you know, the dance party raised around $6,000, which is, was, was fantastic because it was, it, we were really looking at that as a social engagement opportunity. And then let's try to raise some, some funds. So it raised, it did very well. I mean, it's obviously it's not closing our, our budget. Some of the events that we had to cancel are, are events that raised $200,000. So we're trying, right. you know, trying to close some gas, but it was a really, it was successful. And we're looking at some other opportunities. We have an online auction that just opened today and that goes through um, the 30th of April. And, you know, we have some, that's a, that's a bigger scale. We're hoping to do a lot more on that, on that um, project. So it's, we're just trying a lot of new stuff, which is what's keeping us very busy, a lot yes. of smaller <laughs> scale things, but to, to close that gap and to keep our services going while we wait for hopefully to get back to our normal, <laughs> our normal revenue streams um, when this I mean, passes. Do you think that you'll pick up some of these options? You know, one of the things you're talking about is how the, the world will never go back to <laughs> what it was before. I mean, there's, yeah. no, there's no return to normal. There is just a return to normalcy, I think. But yes. that if some of these things work, you know, the online auction may go in collaboration with 
you know, what you had done before, theoretically, that if, yeah. you know, I, I do, be a way. Yeah, I do think we were, we've been talking about this as a team. I do think some of the new ways that we're presenting both fundraising and our programs will stick with us. It's, you know, it's, uh, we are very used to being in live and in person with our families, mm -hmm. but this is um, sort of tested uh, the waters, you know, and it won't, obviously not in the best of circumstances, but right. I do think some of it will stick. Um, the, the trivia was awesome. We had a great time with that. Yeah. And so I do think did it that surprise you that it, that it kind of worked the way it did? It did. It, it, it did. And the interest, um, yeah, I mean, I think it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and it, the, the company that we worked with has been great. And um, they knew it. some things we're kind of executing ourselves and others were, were able to partner with people that know more what they're doing. So that, that <laughs> definitely helps. Um, so I could see that definitely um, carrying on past, past this time, just this new opportunity. So there's always an opportunity to learn. Yes. And some things that we'll probably not want to repeat and others that we'll right. certainly keep doing. <laughs> well, I think the list is long for that, that as, as well, things that if we don't have to do this again. But I think, you know, for your example, you know, being able to text to give is something that we're seeing more of anyway. And I find that a lot of organizations that I talk to say, well, we'd always talked about kind of doing that. We're just now doing it maybe <laughs> sooner than yeah. we, we were going to. And, you know, and... and you also see people stepping up in ways that, you know, you, you can see their passion for your organization as, as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're sharing a lovely art piece and that's, that's an example of another, um, we, we actually do, used to have, or we have had an annual art event with a uh, local artist. Her name is Mary Beth Morrison and she actually was a former news um, anchor here in a local affiliate. Um, but she's, she's donated a piece um, of her art and we're selling prints of that as well. So we have a lot of our supporters are stepping up to help us find ways to do it creatively. You know, she's home painting prolifically and she's like, well, here's some, a great way I can support um, what the work that we're doing. Well, that's, so that's yeah, really beautiful. good opportunities and great, great support from uh, the community stepping up and trying to help us find new ways um, to, to keep us going. And you mentioned that you did, you're did you doing Zoom in home as well. I know that this is another picture of, of how much you work with different organizations in the community as well, working right. with police officers and, and different people to when you're talking about um, interacting with people with autism, having that training to make sure that you, you do that. Are you doing still Zoom trainings in, in that regard or, or depending on, I guess we, we all don't know how long this is going to last, which is which is the right. hold on for a little bit or do we plan for the long term that, you know, if you look at a picture like this, I'm thinking, oh, look at how every, close everyone, <laughs> everyone yeah, exactly. see, right? <laughs> it, is, it has changed the way we look at our, everything, right? And exactly. You know, yeah, um, we are continuing the trainings, you know, when, this, when the closures first happened, we do a lot of training, as you mentioned, with law enforcement and the academies, as well as with um, nursing and medical school students. Um, and so some of those, some of those were canceled, obviously just during the transition, trying to everybody to figure out <laughs> what's next. But we did, we did just start picking up doing some remote training. We did our first one with um, law enforcement and we had to use their, their technology um, uh, to do it. You know, it's a learning curve. It's very different to offer a four hour class that you typically do live and in person with a team of trainers um, <laughs> than over Zoom. So I will say there's a lot for us to learn, but I think that what we're taking from the fact that we are moving forward in, in the, in the um, digital way is that our partners in law enforcement, our partners at the hospitals and the universities value this training so much that they want us to come in and keep doing it um, regardless that the format isn't necessarily ideal. Um, you know, it's, and so that's, that's a plus and we're just going to keep looking at how to refine it and sort of, uh, change our, um, we do a lot of um, experiential exercises in our training, you know, how do you convert that and make it as meaningful digitally. So there'll be a learning curve, but we're, everybody's been gracious, we're all doing it together. You know, we also are still doing our parent trainings. They're a little easier <laughs> to do. They're, they're, they're a little one shorter. One-on-one and, one and, one or one-on-one. Yeah, one-on-one and, one yeah. and a PowerPoint, and it's a little bit more, um, a little bit more uh, easy to, to, to do in the Zoom environment, which is what we're using. But, um, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna definitely keep. It's really important to us, that the first responders especially now. Um, you know that the training is kept up, and for our police officers, 
who are in the um, academy settings, it is a mandatory training. So they, they do need to have that in order to graduate. Um, so we, we need to make sure that we're, you know, help them fulfill their obligations there. And within the community, just in general, the community, the autism community, are you finding across the country or different people that you work with that I know your services are specific to the, the Maryland area, but that people are coming together to share, you know, best practices in this way. How do we get through this pandemic together? How do we help all our families and figure out a way to, to survive this? Are you seeing the unity there? Absolutely seeing that. It's been amazing to me what some of the providers in the area have been doing. You know, there's a there's a local provider who's an does OT and they every day are on live on Facebook doing dance sex sessions and different occupational therapy type exercises that so any time of the day you can get on and, and get a session that way there have been um, yoga instructors um, offering opportunities for people with autism and of course all the telehealth you've seen all of the behavioral health specialists that maybe hadn't ventured into that uh, realm yet because mm -hmm. it again isn't necessarily the ideal way to deliver services or all you know getting into that um, offering that as well too so there is a lot of um, I think you're seeing the providers and the organizations, you know, we collaborate with a lot of other nonprofits here in Maryland, local support groups, and they're all bringing their parent support groups online and coffee talks online, just, just again, to, to keep that network and that connection, um, but that it is really so important for all of us, um, keep that alive and going and, and share, again, sharing these resources and ideas this is what's worked for my child. This is how I explained what's happening. There was a local family that came up with a comic book that was a way to describe um, what the coronavirus is and how you have to wash your hands and social stories and all kinds of different um, um, techniques and ideas. And we're just sharing it collectively as a community. So. Well, and that's fantastic. I mean, 20 years. What I hope is that in 20 years from now, you guys can say, hey, remember that? that pandemic thing 20 years ago yeah that was tough but we got through it and look yes it and i mean that's that's all we can hope that that somewhere in history in the days ahead right this becomes the blip on our screen that we yeah. we learn from um but one that was it's it's a longer blip than any, any of us yeah want, yes but, it's but, it's I look forward to that day. I keep telling my children that, that this is the story they're going to tell their grandkids. <laughs> so ho hopefully it won't take it ever long before I have grandchildren for that to happen. <laughs> or yes. well, it does build uh, some steel in our spine and, and Absolutely. shows the resilience that we have in so many different parts of our society and our community. And, and uh, we hold on tight to that. So Rebecca Ranzi, the Executive Director of Pathfinders for Autism. Thank you so much for your time. We wish you the very best. I'm impressed by all the different ways that you guys are keeping the community together and still keeping that, that lifeline out for folks, you know, as we shelter in place for as long as necessary. Well, thank you very much for having us. And you please stay safe and healthy out there in California. We will. Thank you.